Uh, I'm not going to get to them all if I want to do it. I'll tell you that this basically is uncurry. It's a very souped up well typed uncurry, which says that if you know how to act on, um, in order to know the, how to act on a pair, mm -hmm. you need to know how to act on the, you know, the two components if they were given to you separately, right? So to speak. So to act on a pair of A comma B, you know, is the same as knowing how to act on, take a function from A and get a function from B to your result. So this is a very souped up well typed uncurry. And as we mentioned, mathematical propositions involve uh, equality. So uh, we, we have some of the types that we've uh, sort of introduced before, uh, where we have, you know, for all types A and B, A and B is a type, right? And that's the pair that we just gave. We can do it with either to say A or B is a type. I didn't bother to introduce that one. We have for all types A and B, A implies B is a type, right? That's our uh, function type. We saw that in our rules for judging the well-formedness of types inductively. Mm -hmm. and we have for all in pi. But now, we want to introduce a new type, the equality type, that says for all types A and values x, y of type A, x equals y is a type. So we're going to have a type of equalities between values as a proposition that you'd like to prove. Because if you can't say 2 plus 2 equals 4 in your system, there's probably other portions of mathematics that might not be so good at formalizing. It's a hunch. Um, so, um, to check if that's a type, we have to know that x and y are equal as values of type A. And therefore, we will need our fourth and final judgment. This is a fourfold path. Uh, the four judgments of Martin Law's type theory, we've gotten through them all. x and y are equal uh, values at type of uh, Unfortunately, there's a lot to go over here, and it's actually sort of important. So let's skip over all the parts that look important and get to the parts that don't look important, because those are secretly the most important parts. <laughs> um, and, um, and here's what I mean by that. Um, no, 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 never mind. I, I said that about the wrong thing. This is actually, I, 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 I said that too early. Uh, this we can uh, mainly skip over. It, 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 it's, doing, it's doing what you would expect. It's reducing the terms and checking for their equality in the obvious way. And You've got the one point space right there. Everything in the unit type is equal. Oh. Uh, right? Four lines from the bottom. Yes, everything in the unit type is equal. Um, you could verify that it's a type unit, but you could just omit it. It doesn't matter. Um, that, that's, uh, here, yeah, here, now we're going to get to the part I want to get to. Now, we're going to write another macro and it'll wrap up because we have four judgments. So now, anytime I want to introduce a new type, just so that I don't forget any of the judgments, I'm going to have a macro, and it'll have to take the way to extend each of the four judgments all at once. And I'll say to introduce a new type is to give all four of these judgments simultaneously. And one of the things I actually didn't dwell on here, but that's interesting, is once you introduce the equality type, uh, you'll see that, um, um, so EQ val, rather. once you introduce equality of values, that relies on equality of types. And mm -hmm. equality of types relies on well formedness of types. You have dependencies among all these four judgments. And at the moment, they're sort of form a hierarchy. But once you have full equality types, mm -hmm. you get sort of, it all ties up in a knot. So you have to give them all at once or not at all. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's one of the interesting mm -hmm. things. So you try to write it and you follow the thread, is that it's actually beautifully interlocking these four judgments. If you only have some of them, you can never have a fully dependent system. Because all of them refer to each other. So it's sort of a fourfold induction at once, which is very mathematically elegant. Uh, all right, that's how we do it. Now, now this is the part where the uninteresting parts are interesting. And um, so we say, uh, how do we know that uh, something um, is an equality type? Well, uh, you know, if uh, it's an equality at type type of between values v1 and v2, if, uh, you know, v1 and v2 both have the type of the type Following that, uh, it's <coughs> something has a type, and here we have the comment. Note that we ignore the term. We say that any term at all, we were not even looking at the term, has type EQ type if the two values, V1 and V2, are equal to the type. But we've thrown away the term. So I, I can could, I could hand you a duck and say this is a proof that 1 equals 1. And I'll just check that 1 equals 1. I'll say, yeah, the dots are perfectly fine proof, right? <laughs> it, it's a tautology that 1 equals 1. Mm -hmm. So any term at all is a proof of it. Mm -hmm. So we just ignore it. That's, that's, that's bizarre. Yes. It's deeply mysterious. Definitely and not relevant proof for all, not, right. not relevant logic. 
Yeah, but, but, but you can see why that's the case here is, you know, is if you try to use it, you don't even know how to use it at first. Yeah. Right? Because I already know that one equals one. How could, what can you give me that I possibly would matter? Um, again, um, uh, equality of types um, is uh, the obvious. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not exactly obvious. Um, this is interesting for a different reason. Is, uh, if you, you can start to see the cubes creep in. Because, mm -hmm. right, if you want to check that two equality types are equal as types, You've got a lot of different things you have to check if you really want to be really formal about it. Right? You have to check that the two types that uh, you claim their equalities at are the same type, and then you have to check that uh, the two values in the first position are equal as values, and the two values in the second position are equal as values. So it, it sort of explodes, and which is, which is when you think it's a lot to check something that should be sort of evident on the face of it. Uh, and that's interesting. Yeah. But what's yeah. even more interesting is how do I check that two values of equalities are the same. So if I say this is a proof that you know, one equals one, and this is a proof that one equals one, how do I check they're the same? Wow. Well, Mark Lawson, I don't know. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I, I don't know the paper. Is this somehow sort of, you've presented it obviously since you've heard of HOTT, in such a way that you know, right away there's something here you could add and get HOTT. Um, well, but, but, the, but did Martin loaf? Was there any? I mean, uh, uh, did he, um, I mean, <coughs> yeah, I haven't read the paper. I mean, I've looked at it. But. Uh, he actually, I mean, I, I don't think he always gets you. I, I, don't, I don't know. I think he might have just always given false or something. Like, like you could basically you could do whatever you want, and it's not the type of question you tend to ask. Um, okay, I mean, and there's a prehistory that I we can maybe do afterwards at the bar or something. Okay. I, I mention it here, but I, I mean, don't know. This if is completely to it. explicit, it's right? In what you just said, in the code, and yeah. what you just said. Once you try to do it, that's a thing. It's all the things Markov did, right? This is a man whose genius in part was he right. tried to make. He wanted everything to be evident. He wanted to give you truth. He's a philosopher, right. so therefore the system he builds must be evident, and it must be verified by judgments in a pre-mathematical sense. Right. That you must be able to look at this without having learned you know, higher right. mathematics. Right. And this must be given that obviously this is, this is how you verify things. That was his whole goal. So that's why, in a sense, it's so simple. So and it was only a long bit, time to make it that Only simple. it was a little bit inconsistent. Uh, we fixed like many other systems. So is there any notion of proof equivalence or of transforming one proof into another? Um, no, no, that, or reducing no, a proof yeah. to well, some well, well, yeah, yeah. common... We, have, we, we do have uh, equivalence, right? We have, we, we have um, EQ val. Right? And so I, I, uh, in this system, as we talked about, I can prove that you know, two identity functions are the same and the identity functions are proof. Right? So we, we don't have a rich vocabulary of proof of proofs, <coughs> but you, you can sort of, you check in the most, you check intentionally, as they say. That's why it's in, uh, ITT, intentional type theory, which is terms are the same if they are syntactically the same, subject to some rules like alpha rules. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. That's okay. really interesting stuff comes up. And I'm getting there. Just hang on. But anyway, this is pretty weird. That, that's the point. Mm -hmm. is, and, and in fact, one, when I say that this is important, it does not internalize, which is to say, while it is the case that if I give you two equality types that we judge to be the same type, and I say, are they equal, this function will all say true. I cannot, with what I've given you, write a proof within the language of this. I can't prove for all equality types they're, they're equal. That's just an external fact that we happen to know about the implementation. And, and, that's, and that's actually where all the interesting stuff starts to come in. Uh, so there's our quality intro. Uh, we only have one rule for introducing equality. You give me one term of a type, and I promise you it's equal to itself. And we call that reflexivity. That's the only way you can get equality. You have one thing, and you know it's equal to itself. Um, and, and therefore, it's weird that it has a fairly complicated uh, induction rule. Uh, and, and this was actually invented by Martin Wolf. And it, it, it's, um, without pronouncing the whole thing, um, it says that if you tell me a function that takes some equality at some type and gives me another type out of it, and a value of that type out of it, and if you tell me how that function would act if I gave it the reflexivity proof, then I can tell you how it will act for any other proof. Now, of course, we know that the reflexivity proof is the only one, but it doesn't know that. So it's a very complicated rule that basically says, you know, the action at refer determines the action, quote, everywhere else. You know, but there is no. Everywhere else, at least once you've seen behind the guts. 
And you see that here. The graph. You see that here because if we, you give me an equality at type A between M and N, two, two different um, values of type A. Here we just drop the N on the graph. We, we just ignore it completely. And then we just apply the function at M. Because we know a priori in our system, the only way to get an equality is if M and N are the same thing. So <laughs> therefore I just apply it to whichever one I have and it's as good as applying it to the other. That's weird, man. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, um, it's not clear <coughs> to me. I mean, your, your expressions, you do have some primitive thing that's in all things called lambda calculus. You do have the, the laws of lambda conversion. and They're sort of eaten up there. So it's not literally a sex P as written on the page. It's a sex P under the laws of lambda conversion. Yeah, this is what, uh, well, 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 I mean, the terms are the S expressions. Um, <coughs> we've used about the lambda conversion by applying functions to it, like calling reductions on it and stuff. Okay. Right, so, so uh, that's you can talk about terms that are normalized but, and not normalized. But then one can always internalize. <coughs> that's a, you know, uh, in other no, no. words, you have enough to internalize by rewriting a few lines of this. Uh, what I mean, you could introduce, when I, when I went back here, you mean, does not internalize? Well, that's one place, but you, you said something in the next slide that I don't, I, I, haven't, I haven't parsed the next slide. Uh, uh, right, no right, we'll, let's come back. I'm not yeah, gonna okay. Long. So it's used as an actual proof. Um, here we prove that we define a function not bool that takes true to false and false to true. But we define not not bool to be a function that applies not bool twice. <laughs> and we define identity in bools as a function that just takes a bool and gives back a bool. Now we can define a type family that says give me a type, um, uh, give me a value x of type bool and give me an equality of uh, between and I will give you back an equality between um, bool, uh, between the application of ID bool to x and the application of not not bool to x. Right? OK. Um, I don't give you back a value of that equality. I give you back the type of that equality. So it's, this is a type family. I give it a value of type bool, and it produces a type, which is the proposition that applying these two different functions, identity and double negation, is the same. And we can verify that uh, this has the type, type function from type fool to type type. That's what that is. I've just verified that in the REPL. Now here, uh, we define a type, uh, not not is identity type, as pi type. So for all x of type fool, mm -hmm. uh, this thing holds. And in other words, for all x of type fool, uh, then not not fool is the same as identity in fool. Um, and this is the proof of it, is I apply our Boolean induction principle, and then I apply, uh, uh, and then I just, and that means I have to tell you if it's true, then I'll apply um, REFL at true, and if it's false, I'll apply REFL at false. And um, that's enough to determine this. And then I can verify that this is a proof of that proposition. And now I've proven that at all values of bool, that the two functions coincide. So that's one, that gives you something that's sort of like reasoning about functions. And I have two functions that are not the same. Evidently, I've written them very differently. But they're equal as functions, and I've stated that they act the same in all values. However, what I haven't said is that they're the same function. Because that's extension. I've just said they act the same. We can add, and this is one of the rules of lambda calculus, eta contraction. We've got to add it as a primitive. A primitive that doesn't know how to compute uh, we, instead of closure, we say trust me. It's sort of the same thing, okay. except we just we give back nonsense. We give back whatever we feel like, and you get a stuck term if you actually try to look at the value. But we can apply eta, and just an eta is the claim that if I know, you know, pi, like if I give you, if you give me an a and a b, and uh, two functions between them, then um, I can sort of eta contract them. And if they're equal, in other words, if two functions are equal at all values, then they're equal everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, or they're equal as functions. And yeah. we just yeah. add that as an axiom. And then, uh, here we go. Uh, we've, uh, mm -hmm. we, we can now prove that that could be not be proved before, which is uh, this type and not not as uh, identity exceptional. Which is, there's an equality between uh, the type, you know, uh, at the type function from bools to bools of the identity and double negation. And so that's actually sort of an interesting proof. Now, now it's sort of trivial. You could work it out by hand, obviously, and like, you know, or not, you, you know it innately. You can work it out. But why is it interesting? It's interesting because it shows 
how can you prove something? That, at first, you're like, what does it mean to prove something like that? It's just, oh, you just check every case. And that's what this does. It just gives you a formalism by how you can check every case. And then if you have a function and you need to check the function's action at the case, you can actually apply the function at that case and just check the values. So you know, when it checks this, it goes through and it reduces the application of the functions to true and false. And then, then so yes, I've checked everywhere. So it, 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 makes, it makes it seem very simple how it actually checks these things. And uh, even your most complicated proofs, it's going to do basically the same thing under the hood. So, so these are your, your rocks from the beginning, right? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I said. There's a sense in which it, it, it's just a very sophisticated formal system for counting rocks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's, just, that's just, yeah, that's a good thing. All right, now we come, I am losing people already, but uh, Ray said I could take as long as I want. You so, can, you um, can. <laughs> I don't know how long Google said I could take. Uh, I, I'm going to try to wrap it up with that. We, we've gotten through all the stuff on uh, Martin Moth type theory proper, and now we're going to talk about the homotopy interpretation. Uh, I don't know how far I'm going to get. We'll get as far as we get. Um, so, as you'll recall, way back in our beginning slides, we had, you know, Types are proofs, or types are propositions, programs are proofs, or whatever, or all the different variations. Here's a whole new one. Types are homotopy spaces. <laughs> Elements are points and paths. And again, we have sort of a semi-independent discovery of variations of this by Audi and Warren and Voyevodsky working basically independently. Um, uh, Voyevodsky had, uh, um, introduced the univalence axiom, which is this weird claim that equivalence is equivalent to equality. Or all functions in the universe act continuously, where equivalent things are indiscernible things. Uh, other various ways that you might like to think about it that make it sound less bizarre. <coughs> all of this follows on earlier work, which is uh, Hoffman and Stryker, um, the groupoid interpretation of type theory. And I cite 1998 there. That must be when their uh, when their big paper was published, but I, that can't be right because I was. I, I, I was just looking at some papers last night, and they, they were doing this stuff in maybe 92 through 95, so that, that year is probably wrong. Well. I think 92 is probably correct but, um, uh, for that. So the group point interpretation was um, very important, but, and I, I, I might get to that. <laughs> we'll see. Um, now the problem is I'm not going to talk about homotopy theory at all because I don't have time to introduce it, so I can't talk about why, what it means for a type to be a space, really. But I can just talk about, um, in a general sense, uh, what we're doing here, and why it's a different notion of interpretation. So, here's an aside, which is non-standard models. And here is, this is not normally given in the literature as an example of a non-standard model, because it's so simple. I hope it's still a correct one. Um, pick an equational theory such as the following, uh, terms composed of some symbols, true, false, and, or not, you know, given the usual arities. Um, and pick just a few formulas. And I've only picked a couple, but we can add a few more, like not, not A equals A, you know, and you know, and distributes over or, right? I've, I've only checked those those few. I, I think the rest will hold. But uh, so here's a few formula that I hold in this theory. And obviously, in some sense, the standard or intended model. If I tell you I've got a theory like this, you think, well, T stands for true, and F stands for false, or you know, T and F stand for the bits zero and one, and the you know, the binary operations and and or or whatever, right? And this is sort of. I'm sorry. What, are, are, are we actually? You actually expect to write down the standard axioms for Boolean algebra? No, not all of them. I'm, I'm throwing in just some terms and some formula. I, 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 I haven't worked the whole thing through, but this is trying to be an evocative example. Okay. So we'll see how badly I got it. No, I mean, it, but it's an important question because if it's if yeah. it's if it's all of the usual ones, then you get Boolean algebras. If it's yeah. not all of them. Yeah, I think I've omitted, I, no, I've, I've omitted some, I, okay. I, so I, I, but okay. I haven't said which are omitted because okay, okay. I couldn't find a textbook version of this example that I could just copy and I didn't want to work through all of the stuff. <laughs> we'll work it out later. Yeah. So um, now add the axiom that there exists an A such that A equals not A. Yes. Okay, whoa. Well. well, now you've got to have some, some U such that not U equals U, right? A is sort of for all A, right? Right. 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 right? So now we actually need a, Existed. We need a term. Right. And then you can say, well, how do we make this coincide with the axioms we've already given? Okay. Well, one way we could do that is to add this set of formulae. Uh, true, and, true or undefined equals true, false or undefined equals undefined, true and undefined equals undefined, false okay. and undefined equals false. And you'll recognize this as sort of sequels three valued logic. Right? Give or take. Okay. Right? This is, this is basically U acts a lot like null and sequel. No, nothing. No, maybe not exactly, but yeah, it, it, it's true. sort of close. Okay. Uh, but, and now, so what we're going to say is this forces a non standard model. 
So if, if I gave you formulae that were just right. based on this page, you would say, oh, you're working over the Booleans. Right. And I'll say, but this also holds. And you'll say, wait, no, it can't. You were working over the Booleans. No, it, it did. Okay. Because adding a u such that not u equals u is completely consistent okay. with the axioms I gave on the previous page. Mm, so what true. we find is this trick that mathematics plays on us, is we think we're talking about concrete objects, but we're not. We're talking with symbols that we typically expect to hold for one class of concrete objects, but may hold for other objects that we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so given the stuff on this page, there's no way to know whether such a U exists or not. Right? But then I can add an axiom such as that. Now that fixes such a U must exist. Now I consider another axiom. And, and here I think this gets to Jay's question. For all A, A or not mm -hmm. A equals true. Right. Well, now, now, now that other axiom can't hold. Right. So, so you, well, well, one axiom forces a U. Right. The other rules out at least the U such as it, the one we've introduced It, it, it rules out non-trivial ones. Mm -hmm. It can only rule out non-trivial right. ones because it, it's an equational theory, therefore the one element algebra yeah. always satisfies. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. It rules out non-trivial ones. Right. That's okay. important. But it, yeah. so, but, so, so, so this is sort of the, this, this phenomenon occurs all over the place. Mm -hmm. It occurs in piano arithmetic. <laughs> That's amazing for piano arithmetic. Yeah, now, piano arithmetic is like, no, those are fun, but I don't think they're very useful. It turns out the non Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Whoa. Oh, oh, it's that one. All right, I, I take it back. <laughs> Some of the non-standard models I know of are, are giant. They, they have infinite, you can't even touch them computationally. They're, they're so infinite. All of them you can't touch computationally. Yes, there we go. So, so therefore, maybe they're useful, but they're not useful if you want to implement them on a computer. Which, uh, <laughs> so so they're, um, real numbers, on the other hand, you, you, you get non-standard analysis, and you can talk about uh, sort of, and, and those are actually very useful in sort of just formalizing, um, and it's the same story, where you, you thought you had one model, right. but it turns out if you have this other axiom, yeah. you, you induce all these other elements you didn't know existed, they were just hiding in the wings. Right. And then you have another axiom and rule out those elements. Um, and it's all the same across all these different non-standard models, like the point of the story. So they come from extending or portion based standard models, or so-called intended models, right? But you know, there's really no such thing as a standard model. It's just the one that we think we're working with. It, it, it's a psychological model. And so we can inflate or flatten the possibilities to these axioms. Um, so uh, one way that you can think about homotope, the homotopy interpretation of type theory is it's a non-standard model. And all along, we thought we were working in you know the theory of types they were, in which they correspond to the type lambda calculus or something. And it turns out we really weren't. That's we're working over a whole class of theories, and that's just the one, that's the only one that we imagined. And um, here's the principle. That if we add, if we internalize the thing that I said didn't internalize, which says sure. that um, mm -hmm. all identity proofs are equal. Right. Or all identity proofs at the same type are the same. Mm -hmm. Um, which, and that's, just, that's called uniqueness of identity proofs. And there's another version of it called axiom theory. Right. Um, and it says, for, you know, for all A of type type, um, for all X of type A, for all Y of type A, for all P of equalities at that type between X and Y, and all Q of equalities mm -hmm. between that type X and Y, I can give you a proof that those two equalities are equal. So it says, give me all this stuff, and I'll just give you a proof that they're all equal. Uh, that's compatible with intuition of type theory, but it's not provable within it. And, and, and this is what Hoffman and uh, Stryker realized. And the way they did it was using model theory, is they gave an interpretation of type theory where this did not hold. Mm -hmm. And that is the so-called groupoid interpretation of type theory, where you, you didn't go all the way up to the infinity groupoid and homotopy type theory, but you went up one level. Right. And, and right. that was enough to prove that this didn't always hold. And, and that was the, the, the result that started this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Because until then, we didn't know. It was an open question whether or not you could prove this inside type theory. Mm -hmm. And by exhibiting a model where it didn't hold, they showed that it must be the case that you could not prove it in type theory, a consistent model, non-trivial. Mm -hmm. And so now the opposite question is, what is an axiom that might necess necessitate a non-standard model? And the answer that Wojewalski gave us is the univalence axiom. And I actually went and I wrote out the whole thing, <laughs> which was an interesting exercise. Um, I don't know if I have time to read through it all. I, I, I guess I do. Uh, I don't know if you want me to read through it. Yes, read through um, it. Yeah. Well, uh, Please. Yes? Yeah, are, are we okay here? We're not drowning in code? We're, we're, all right. Let's try to pronounce this. Um, it, it has a lot of pieces to state it in the correct way. The informal way is, of course, equivalence is equivalent to quality. But nobody believes that at first. Like, you hear it, 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 it sounds That's nonsense. You don't even know what equivalence and equality mean. Right. So, it's, so, so, so it, it's just, you know, minced meat is equivalent to soup. Yes. To make it less nonsense, 
You're not saying that equivalence is equal to equality. You're saying it's equivalent. Yeah, yeah, but once you induce that, you can say that it's equal. Uh, equal. So it doesn't. Um, that now, 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 but the point is, we can, we can turn this into a precise statement in type theory. And, and that's what this does. And I've taken one of the definitions from the book and just sort of turned it. Mm -hmm. right. You'll notice I don't really have any lambdas and pi, uh, any pi's and sigma's in this. I, and I, I'm just writing all in scheme. I hope that makes it more, not less recognizable to the list <laughs> section of our book. Um, so first we define function composition, because I hadn't bothered to define it. Yeah. So it's just, you know, composing f and g is applying f to the mm -hmm. uh, result of g. Uh, we define the type of homotopies between two functions f and g and, uh, and a type family p. So we have a type a, a type family p, that sends values of a to types in the universe. And a homotopy between two functions says that I've got a function here and a function here, and if I give them the same a, then they're going to land in the, same, um, in the same place at the same type because we, we've, they mm -hmm. both are functions from A to P of A, right? So I, I give them a value A, and they're going to land in some place up here in, in P of A, and it's going to be the same, or it's going to be equivalent. It's going to be... It, or rather, it's going to be equal up to a path. Up to, right. It, it, it is essentially <laughs> what they can do. But here, that's just equal because equality is path equality. Right. So okay. we're going to say, oh, it's going to land in the same place. And um, therefore, uh, those two functions are homotopical to one another. Right. Uh, all right? And, and that's sort of a souped up version of the extensional thing yes. that I, I, I had given earlier, where uh, they always can take equal types to equal values, but now they do so in sort of a dependent fashion, even if they're doing so over uh, sort of, you know, results that may vary based on the type of the interval. You see, those are homotopic functions. Um, and now, we define the type is equivalent, which is given a function f between two types a and b. We say that function is an equivalence, right? What does it mean for a function to be an equivalence? Well, it means that, you know, it sends something to something else and you always come back, right? So then it's equivalence. That, that, that's the claim, right? We don't give both sides the equivalence. We just say a function that goes one way from here to there is an equivalence. You can always come back and it's like you never left. All right, so, and here we use sigma, which I, introduced at all, um, so I apologize. Uh, the sigma is there exists, that's all we're going to say about it for now, and, and it's a pair of uh, the, the type of thing that exists sort of and then the value of it, um, mm -hmm. in a sense. So we're going to say there exists, so a function is an equivalence. If there exists a function from b to a, we have a function <coughs> from a to b, it's an equivalence if there's a function from b to a, mm -hmm. such that we have a homotopy between composing f with g and the identity function. <coughs> and also that we have, there exists another function h that we put on the other side and that's also homotopical to the identity function. So it's, again, it's like saying that things act equally at equal points, but it's, it's a bit weaker. You sort of stretched it out a bit, which is, which is sort of important. And um, this is, uh, so a function's an equivalence, right? And this mm -hmm. is a fancy way of saying if, it, and we split it up in two. If I'm, if I'm here and I can come back and then send the function there, and then if there's another way that if I'm here and I go there, there's another way to come back here. That makes the function an equivalence. And then that, if I do both things, maybe it's not exactly the identity type on the nodes, but I've got a proof that it acts the same as the identity function everywhere that I look. Okay, um, so now we say, uh, Two uh, uh, ty type of crib A and B is an equivalence between types A and B. So now I, we're not talking about functions anymore, right? And then we talk about homotopies between functions and stuff. So it's two types, any old types in the universe. So these two types are equivalent. If there exists any such function, such that that function is between them and that function is an equivalence, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really care. And then the classic example again is let's stick to small things, let's stick to bools, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Identity is, um, like, bool, bool is equivalent to itself two ways. Mm -hmm. It's equivalent to itself by sending true to true and false to false, or by sending true to false and false to true by applying mm -hmm. not, as we had above. Um, so there's a type of equivalence between bool and bool, that's boring. But the point is there's two ways that you can spell that type of equivalence, and it doesn't matter which you pick. And if I had two things, if I had one type named bool and another type named 
2, and it had two values 1 and 2 in it, right, those two would be equivalent in two ways too. Mm -hmm. But, um, and we've just named, and so this is an equivalent. Mm -hmm. And now, the univalence axiom says, but you know, again, it's a sigma, so you don't, um, you have, there exists an equivalence, and, and you can look at the equivalence, but it's, you know, you're not saying there merely exists an equivalent somewhere in the world, you're saying here's a particular one. Mm -hmm. So now the univalence axiom can be stated very concisely once we've done all this. It says, for all A that is, that is a type, and for all B that are a type, it is an equivalence between the types of the equivalence between A and B and the qualities of A and B as types. And that's it. That's the univalence axiom. It, it's a proposition about types. When we say equivalence is equivalent to equality, we mean that two types that are equivalent, you know, and you know, really loosely speaking, in bijection, right? Are, that, that's the same, that's in bijection with them being equal to each other, in some sense. I, I'm sorry if that's not a great explanation, but the, the types are correct. What's type back again? That's the type EQ is, you can read that as, that's the type of equality. So there's an equality at type type between A and B, or a path between. A path between. That's path equality. Okay. Type EQ is path equality. Okay, thanks. Okay. So right, this is just stating that there's an equivalence this, between saying that A and B are equivalent to types and saying that A and B are equal as types. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amazing thing about the univalence axiom is it forces a non-standard model. And it says that identity proofs cannot be unique. Right. Because mm -hmm. I can give you two identity proofs of, you know, bull to bull. Uh, of, you know, mm -hmm. one that leaves it the same and one that's the twist map. They're obviously not the same because I can look inside and I can apply them and they'll do different things. So um, this thing that seems so obvious no longer is obvious. And here's a model that invalidates it. And here's an axiom that invalidates it and gives rise to a whole new universe of all these secret objects that were all, all, just like we could add these non-standard elements like nulls to our uh, Boolean logic. And you, know, you couldn't tell if you weren't looking for them. Same thing here. There's all this latent structure, and the univalence axiom sort of inflates it and uh, gives it meaning. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I showed you MESS, uh, the Martin Loff uh, Extensible uh, Specification Simulator. Uh, let's talk about how to make a hot mess. Um, so proud of that show. Um, <laughs> um, so um, here is gestures. I, I have implementing computation is hard. I'm going to show you why it is hard. Or at least I'm going to leave you at a point where it's not obvious how to proceed and therefore you'll agree with me that it's hard. There's been great strides made in it because the difference is Martinoff type theory, as I said, it computes. Not only is it computable and decidable, which HOT is as well. It's design, HOT is a decidable theory. That's no problem. I, you can apply all the judgments and everything. It all works. But we have this additional fact in uh, Martinoff type theory that if you don't introduce axioms where you get stuck on, Everything computes, so you can get normal forms of proof terms at the end of the day, right, that are the actual objects of verifications. If things don't compute, you sort of have to sort of believe in some sense in something external to your system. And, and you don't want to have to believe in, in these things. You, you want to have a system in which you can build everything directly. <coughs> and, and furthermore, if you ever want to turn it into a programming language, you definitely need that. So hot <coughs> doesn't compute um, yet. Um, there's a variant of hot that, uh, called the cubicle uh, type theory that it actually looks like it actually 100% completely computes. They're still working out some details. You can download it, compile it. I did it. Uh, it'll actually calculate homotopy groups of spheres. For you. It's, I mean, you have to tell how to do it. Obviously. It's, it's not magic, but it does all the right stuff. And you, know, you can ask it to check some terms that look <laughs> innocuous, and it'll take seven minutes. So, um, but it works. <coughs> so um, it, it's no longer the case that you know, quote, hot doesn't compute in a sense. A system very much like hot, very much appears to compute, although not everyone has finished checking all the details of all the papers. However, <coughs> hot itself doesn't quite compute, and, um, which is a system that's not been extended in we, we, the ways that they did it with cubic or at least not yet. And that's still an interesting, although maybe less interesting question, because now we have cubic with DT, and that's great, and everyone's just playing with that. <laughs> maybe this will be worth the dust as a problem. Yeah. Sorry, I'm rambling here. Um, but if assuming, they didn't have cubicle TT when I started doing this, so that's why I'm doing it. Um, assuming, and just to think about it, assuming that we had the system I've described and, and we want to say, how do we make it compute? And how do we start to reason about it and not just give univalence as an axiom? 
Well, the first thing is we need to fill in those holes that I pointed out, those places where our qualities were just dropped on the floor and we ignored them. Yeah. But what, what would we fill in to those holes if, they, if we wanted to really put something in? Well, we ignored the quality term before when we said, well, you know, you know, two things are equal if we just normalize them and they look equal. And instead, you know, or that equality type is inhabited. Instead, we're going to have a judgment that says that this path is a valid path. Right? And by equality, I'm saying path here, because mm -hmm. we can think of these things as being connected. Mm -hmm. They're not exactly the same anymore, but they lie on a path together. And we'll say that, that this path, this equality type, is a path between two points x and y. So we had a new judgment, is path. And say, is p a path between x and y of type a? Oh, and then we had another new judgment. In type t, between points x and y, p and q are equal as paths. And that's the other place. We just said paths are all as equal, or paths are never equal, or whatever we wanted. Uh, instead, we're going to actually have a judgment on path equality, which will say that there exists a homotopy between these paths. Mm -hmm. And you just add these as more judgments to your system. And that actually turns out not to be hard. And I, I, I've got some gestures, in, not, not in the main repo, because I've just been playing around with okay. it. But, you know, because and, and, you can just start adding paths as you please, and you can, you know, well, how do I define the inverse of a path? Well, let me just add a con cell, where if it, to invert a path, yeah. I, I call it inv of path. And I'll figure out the computation later. I'll say inv of inv disappears. I'll just, who knows, right? Right. Um, that's easy. This is the hard part. Computation. <coughs> this is the same thing I wrote before, the quality induction rule. Where before, we just said, well, we can apply our uh, function we're given to m. And it doesn't matter. Because, you know, we know m and n are the same. Now m and n are not the same. You can have a quality between two things where if you actually open them up and look at the bit patterns, they're different. Because they may be equal by a non-trivial pattern. So how do you write this? <laughs> yeah, now you can write other things. You can write transport where you can say if, you know, I, I, I can apply a path by going through and rewriting all my m's to m's inside a term. But in this sense, it's even weirder. Because now, right, this is saying, in homotopy language, if you give me um, no, so, so, so we're at some type A, and then you give me this <coughs> big new type family that uh, <coughs> takes an x of that type and a y of that type, and a function that sends a qualities, uh, and a function, yes, so, so the, the type is, give me an x, sorry, <laughs> it's hard to read this, <laughs> even for me. You, no get, you get a giant type family, see. <laughs> Yes, we have a giant type family C, I know, but I'm trying to describe it. And um, it, takes, uh, it takes an X and a Y and an equality and returns a type. Oh, yes, it's the type, the type form lies in that. Sorry, I, I was on current and wrong in my head. Yes, it takes an X and a Y and an equality between X and Y and it returns a type. That's the type family. Thank you, Tom. And then we take a function that it, you give just any value of type A and it applies it to the type family where, where, with the reflexive equality that value to itself, right? And then you give it two different values of type A, and, or two potentially different values, but that are connected by a path. Mm -hmm. And now you have to apply it to that. And, and now that's, you're, the, the, they're, you're, they're not the same anymore. They're just connected by a path. So what does it mean to apply it to that? <coughs> well, that's really weird because if I applied it here, well, this, this is M and this is N, sorry. So I apply it here. Well, that's not the same as applying it all across the path. I apply it here. It's not the same as applying it all across the path. But I don't know how to apply it at both. It's just one function. <laughs> and then, you know, and, 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 how, what does that even mean? I, I, I'm, it, it's difficult to think about. And, and there are ways to approach it. But I'm, I'm just saying that I want to point this out. This is where you, you think you're humming along. You're like, oh, a lot of people say computing with univalence is so hard, and then go through and you go, oh. <laughs> uh, okay, right, and, and, and then really people have sort of bashed their heads about this, and they've made good progress, but they've been working on this for a number of years now. So the, the best and the brightest. So this is, it, 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 this is difficult. And in cubicle type theory, what they do is they extend the terms so that you no longer, so that I can say things I couldn't say before. Yeah. And they let you quantify not over just variables and types, but things they call dimensions which are sort of abstract directions in which paths may go. Mm. And by quantifying over the dimensions and then providing systems of connections in the dimensions, you actually sort of write geometrical terms directly in here. 
And those geometrical terms you write sort of describe exactly what you would want to happen. And it removes this problem. Now, when you normalize, you don't just get back, though, your lambda terms. You get back lambda terms intermixed with geometrical terms. So, so, so that, that's sort of like if we introduce you know, the axiom, a you know, equals, there's, there exists some a such that a equals not a, you end up having this new guy u that didn't exist before. You don't just have sort of new axioms. But to talk about it, you might actually need to have new terms and new syntax in your language. Mm -hmm. And that's what cubical type theory does. And it looks like it, and there's a number of different approaches. I'm just talking about the one uh, like so this. Is this like having a new kind of quantification beyond existentials and universals? Yes, but you don't quantify over, over variables of types. You quantify over this other thing, a dimension. Okay. Or, or, or which, which can also be described as sort of a namespace almost. It, it's, a very, it, it, it's sort of hard to wrap your head around. I, I'm not there yet. I, I would like to spend some time on it. I don't understand very much about this, but it looks to me like it's just too naked. I'm just going to repeat it. It, just, it looks too naked. If you approach it from here, mm -hmm. You don't have enough, and I don't like to use the word because it has all these you know, heavy suggestions. Geometry, you're missing geometry. Yeah. All you have is equal or not equal. <coughs> if you add any geometry to it, then you, you know, okay, I won't. Well, I won't no, 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 the other thing, anyway, it, it, it's, a, it's a good open question whether or not you can make act hot without these extensions compute. So adding geometry. Well, I think there's good reason to think that you yeah. should be able to. Well, but it also seems like, you know, when you did this, you know, there's also a fact that we'll, we'll forget out. Say it later. We'll, we'll, we'll do it after. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm basically done. Is, I think I've led really you to some good. interesting stuff yeah. here. I, I didn't get to actually have, to, you know, like, you saw homotopy in the sense that I had my hands and I pretended there were lines between them. I'm sorry that that. That's homotopy. Yes. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to conclude now. Um, why does homotopy type theory matter? Not just because you can get extensionality from it, which was only an axiom before. I didn't mention that you can get it from from univalence. Uh, Homotopy type theory en enables synthetic mathematics. And that's what we've been looking at at the Hot Reading Group. That's been a lot of fun. Is your people come from a computer science type theory background, lambda calculus background, people that know about homotopy theory and sort of the mathematics of topology and, you know, spaces and shapes. And it, it turns out that unlike other proof systems where you can just sort of spell that set theoretically, right, once I've said equality is a path, and now equalities between equalities, right? I have a path here and a path here, and it sweeps out a path. Now I've got a box, and then I can have cubes, and I can glue them together, and I can build shapes directly with my types. And so therefore, I can do math that you might have to, like, normally build up a lot of levels yeah. of machinery and just do it all at once, because it's given. And I'm going to make the claim that this is not the last time we're going to see this with Martin Loft type theory. When I said it was an open system, this is the beauty of it. It enables the introduction of new synthetic objects and axioms at all points at whatever level you like. And so uh, it's very exciting work. And uh, the book is much more readable than you would imagine. Just download the book, start reading it. Uh, there's a homotopy type channel on, theory on, channel on IRC, uh, freenode.net, or the plain old type theory channel um, on freenode.net. <laughs> the plain old. Um, it's, it's just called type theory, not plain old type theory. <laughs> people hang out there too. If you want to start learning this stuff, asking plain questions, plain. there's people that love to explain things. Um, and now, this is mainly for when the slides go online. I'm going to just give a bunch of references to conclude. There's a bunch of various mm -hmm. simple dependent type systems, some of which I've been inspired by, some of which I discovered later. The Simply Easy paper, Lenard has a simpler, easier blog post. <laughs> Based on Simpler Easier, my friend Dan Dole wrote a pure type system, which is a very nice Haskell interpretation of actually a whole bunch of different type theories. He does a bunch of different pure type systems. Stephanie Warwick's uh, mm -hmm. Pi for All, which she talked yeah, about at Compose, um, and gave uh, lectures on at the summer school. And uh, there's one from uh, Kakand uh, called uh, Simple Th Type Theoretic Language Mini Kiki. That's about 400 lines of Haskell. I discovered that late, but that's pretty good too. And then, of course, there's my Git repo from Nest, which is the oh, cool. fewest lines of code of the bunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> used every trick in the book. Uh, I've got more references to you, yes. You're going to post it? Yeah, 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 I'll post the slides. Yeah. Um, uh, you just, if you could uh, send them to me, that would be great. That, the next set of references. Mm -hmm. uh, the first couple here, Software Foundations, Introductory Text mm -hmm. for Programming in Coq, which is one dependently type proof system. Programming in Martin Luss Type Theory is an interesting book because it's not about programming in any particular la um, computer system. It's sort of programming in the conceptual sense. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's a very good book. Um, all, uh, many of Martin Luss' papers are now collected online at this uh, lovely GitHub repo. 
the, um, they, they range all over the place. The ones that are most relevant are the early office book, Intuitionistic Type Theory, uh, the article I cited, Constructive Math and Computer Programming, and the other one I cited in this talk on the meaning of logical content and uh, constant identification. Uh, this is not the normal stuff that people cite, but it's interesting, so I thought I'd cite it, mm -hmm. because it, it sort of shows more the logical framework background of these things and other things. So on logical frameworks, you can read Harper and Ponsell and Plotkin's A Framework for Defining Logic. That talks about the origins of the notion of a logical framework, and sort of how one might want to think of scheme as a logical framework, or in their case, ML or such. The theory of Lego. Lego is no longer developed as a proof assistant, but it was designed to unify a lot of different type theories. So it's again, if you're just interested in the type theoretical standpoint, not the system you want to program with, mm -hmm. it, it, it's in some ways a more theoretically interesting thing to approach. And Type Checking with Universes by Harper and Pollock gives the algorithm such that I can put type and type everywhere, and then <laughs> after the fact, run a quick inductive procedure to determine if there is an assignment that um, is consistent <laughs> or not. And so that is, I promised where we'd get to that. And that's Harper and Pollock's uh, Type Checking with Universes. Uh, here are some languages if you actually want to down, if, this is fun on pen and paper, just getting up and talking to people or, or doing this game, but if you want to actually use a real language that mm -hmm. has tools, as you've seen, these things get very long for simple terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having a bit of inference, so you don't have to write everything, mm -hmm. goes a long way. And these tools here have a lot of you know, niceties and large libraries of standardized math and uh, large parts of homotopy type theory formalized in them. So, uh, Koch and Agda have hot formalized in them. Idris is more designed to be a programming language that happens to have dependent types. And New Pearl, as I mentioned, is this very, very different, uh, unique system from uh, Cordell. And Homotopy uh, Type Theory has a wonderful web page. The book is free from the web page. Like $29 if you can order it. Uh, there's the GitHub repos for all the code that formalizes the book. And here is a free online textbook on algebraic topology. It's got a chapter on homotopy theory. I don't know if it's actually easier to read that or to learn it from the book. Um, <laughs> but depending on your background, one or the other. Mm -hmm. And for you, Jay. Ah, thank you. Uh, it's not quite right. I just finished it off okay. and didn't get rid of all the bugs right before I came over here. Right. But it, the, 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 this is the core of Harper and Hansel, uh, uh, Harper and Pollock's okay. algorithm. And it's actually very interesting, and we can talk about why it's a bar. Because it ties into the theory of non-well-founded sets, in, oh, okay. in my humble opinion. Okay. I, uh, okay. I haven't found the literature on it, but I think it must be the case. All right, thank you very much for letting me talk to you. I don't know if you have time for questions or not. Um, we kind of don't. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I thought you said I could talk as long as I want. Well, I yeah. <laughs> well, I did say, no, you guys are interested in your... Uh,